Hey, dude. Howdy, folks. How goes it? Just, just a nod. Good morning. Good morning, Darlene. Wow, big crowd this morning. I know. What is going on? Friday. <laughs> but it's raining outside. <laughs> true, true. Not like everybody's going for a run or anything. That is true. Everybody's cuddled up in bed. Yeah, maybe that's it. It's too early. Hey, Darlene, how was your outing? Good. Well, the first one was not that great, but I mean, it's, it's everything that everybody told me it was going to be like. <laughs> Long lines. It's not very enjoyable. Yeah, I had to wait outside for 45 minutes, and then you don't feel like you can really leisurely shop because you know there's going to be more people waiting outside the door, and I don't know, wearing the whole mask thing is just annoying and yeah, just wasn't fun. But I got my flowers and they're all planted and it was so unhappy. Oh, nice. And now they're getting snowed on. Yeah, lovely, eh? Yeah, that's crazy this morning. You never know. I don't think it snowed here. Oh, it, it didn't? Uh, it probably did, but it was, it was hardly, it was just, you had to look to see it, but it was... It looked like rain, but there was snow in it, too. Okay. Like at least a, about a half an hour ago when I looked outside. Yeah. I was out walking the dog, and uh, it was definitely snowing. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh. <laughs> it was gross. I might have to cover up those flowers. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I was wondering about that. Do you just cover it up when they when it gets to freezing temperatures? Well, I or? think so. I think okay. they can handle a little bit of snow as long as it's not real heavy. weighs them down, right? So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't think anything was sticking, so maybe it's okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's still above zero, but. It's scary. Gross snow nonetheless. Yeah. yeah. You never right. know. It's not June yet, so you never know here, right? No, that's for sure. That's... Oh, that's. Uh... I'm to move to Florida. That's something. <laughs> it's something. Michael loves Alberta weather. <laughs> Michael does not love Alberta weather. <laughs> well, give me snow compared to Seattle rain any day. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I felt so. I was out walking the dog last night and it was raining and about, oh, I don't know, 40, 43, so low 40s, whatever that is here, three, four degrees maybe. Yeah. And I felt like, oh, yeah, this is a Seattle winter right here. See, I don't know, it's about as bad as it gets, so. Yeah. <laughs> oh, look at that. We just had to wait a few extra minutes, Darlene. Yeah, here they all are. Art's here. We can start now. <laughs> look at Art's haircut, eh? Look at that thing. Hey, look at that, eh? Oh, yeah. Art, you look good. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I, I've looked bad for months now, and uh, now I look good. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. Yeah. <laughs> that was not implied there. Amazing what a little pruning can do, eh? It is. <laughs> Because you hold those perspective on life. You don't have yeah. to bother with your hair anymore. Yeah. What was that experience like? Did you have to to call ahead, wait in line? What, how'd that look? Walked right in. Nobody there. <laughs> it was, it was cool. wow. right, right around the corner from Trinity, right there. So, wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I thought that it was going to, all the, uh, the hair places were going to be pretty busy. I would have thought so too, yeah. And I didn't I wear a mask. they were going to be hairy. I didn't even wear a mask. So um, there you go. You never know. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Why don't we get started together? Okay. We're going to read Psalm 8 today. And before we do that, let's pray. Lord, our Lord, we bow before you in praise and prayer and thank you for your glory and majesty. And we pray that we may faithfully follow you and serve you. Will you bless us as we read your word to understand again who you are, who we are, and what we need from you. Lord, lead and guide us by your spirit now, for Jesus' sake. Amen. So, Psalm 8. 
Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the path of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, Psalm 8 starts out with praising the Lord and speaks to the relationship between God and humanity. It's a bit of a change in the Psalms as from what we've seen before, but it starts and ends with the same words. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now, it's always good to look for repetition in the Psalms as you look for a main theme or focus, looking, looking for what the writer wants us to take away. So we want to unpack those verses for starters. Lord is God's covenant name. Every time you see Lord in capital letters in the NIV Bible, that's like reading Yahweh in the Hebrew, which is often translated as Jehovah in the King James but this is the name God gave for himself when Moses asked him who he is. God said, I am who I am, or just I am. This is God's covenant name. This is the name that always reminds us that God initiated a relationship with mankind in which he promised to be faithful to his word. When we read this name, we should always think this is our faithful, trustworthy God. This covenant connection comes out immediately in this psalm when David puts us in relationship to this faithful God saying, O Lord, our Lord, and our Lord is important. God covenanted with Israel, promising to bless them as they walked in faith with him. And this is not some unknown, mysterious, hidden God. This is the God who came and continues to come to David and Israel and now to us seeks to build our relationship with him. So he's our Lord, our God. And we are in a great relationship with this mighty God. You should notice in the NIV that the second occurrence of Lord is different than the first one. The first one is capital letters, God's covenant name, Yahweh. But the second one is Lord with lowercase letters. And that's more like the old English understanding of Lord which means master or governor. It's a term of submission and reverence in this psalm. Yahweh, you're our master. You are the supreme ruler, and we look to you. How majestic is your name in all the earth. This is David setting up God as supreme and all wise. No one is greater, more majestic, more worthy of praise than God. No one is greater in all the earth. God's glory is greater than the heavens above the earth, even, he says. So David is perhaps thinking about those times when he was a shepherd boy and he laid on the grass out in the pastures and looked up at the sky in the dark world around him. And the sky lit up perfectly at night with moon and stars shining in all of their glory. Only a fraction, he's suggesting here, of the grandeur and glory of God. James Boyce wrote, the reason the creation, wonderful as it is, cannot exhaust the glory of God is that God is its maker. If God has set his glory above the heavens, it is certain that nothing under the heavens can praise him adequately. And that's what we see when we read the center of Psalm 8. The entire center of this Psalm, verses 2 to 8, puts humanity in our place reminds us of God's lofty purpose for us and of our failure by the same token to live up to that calling and so of our need for Jesus to make things right. 
David says in verse 2 that the Lord ordains praise from the lips of children and infants. As I was studying it, there were a lot of interesting discussions about those words, but let me just say that David seems to be contrasting, as the Bible often does, the weak and the strong by flipping those on their head. Here then David is saying that even babies know that God is supreme and glorify him. They do a better job of giving glory to God than grown-ups do at times. Their baby lips without legible words do a better job at praising God than grown people who often refuse, like enemies of God, to acknowledge God's greatness. I kind of like how John Calvin describes this. It's an interesting quote. The, old, the English isn't real familiar to us. It's a kind of a old English. But anyway, he says, The tongues of infants, even before they are able to pronounce a single word, speak loudly and distinctly in commendation of God's liberality toward the human race. Whence is it that nourishment is ready for them as soon as they are born, but because God wonderfully changes blood into milk? Whence also have they the skill to suck, but because the same God has by a mysterious instinct fitted their tongues for doing this. David, therefore, has the best reason for declaring that although the tongues of all who have arrived at the age of manhood should become silent, the speechless mouth of infant is sufficiently able to celebrate the praise of God. Calvin is simply reminding us that babies, when sucking the breast, are praising God for supplying their needs as they drink with satisfaction. Meanwhile, grown-ups ignore the Lord and fail to praise him. Jesus picked up on this when he quoted Psalm 8 on Palm Sunday. He declared that the unbelieving leaders of the Jews um, chastised the children chanting Hosanna, but the children had a better understanding of God and of Jesus than the learned men of the Sanhedrin who were trying to dismiss Jesus as a madman. The psalm goes on to remind us that God has given us as human beings a calling to care for the world that he made. Our work should declare God's majesty and glory. We are second in command, God's vice rulers over the world. The language recalls God's words to Adam and Eve to tend the garden and rule over the creatures, to take care of the world, the creation, to steward it in behalf of the Lord. Now, history shows that we haven't done a great job of that. God has put all things under the feet of mankind. We are given dominion over it, but we have failed over and over. And I can't get into all the different ways we've done that this morning, but let me just think very briefly with you about COVID-19 for a moment. Here's a tiny little virus that shows we really don't have control over the world. One invisible germ is able to paralyze humanity. Yes, we're trying hard to fix it, get it under control, but clearly we're not in control. This is a global pandemic. The whole world is bowing before a little virus. So who's got dominion here? We need to turn to Jesus, the true man. We need to let him take control, take back control of the world that God gave to Adam and Eve and to us to control. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, the chapter on the resurrection, shows us that humanity is dead in Adam's sin, but because of our sin, we aren't able to rule the world as God intended at creation. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, all who are in Christ form a new humanity. Psalm 8 tells us that God's plan was for all things to be under his feet, meaning humanity's feet, but that's not been going well. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that it is Jesus who fulfills this calling. He's the true man. He's the fulfillment of what mankind was called to be. So echoing Psalm 8, verse 6, Paul says that God put all things under the feet of Jesus. Jesus redeems all of creation. 
And now under his authority, we will one day reign perfectly over creation as well in the way that was intended at the beginning. In Revelation 3 verse 1, Jesus speaks to us and says that one day we will sit with him on the throne in that position of ruling or dominion because he's the one who conquered. He's the one who restored the world through his death and resurrection. And then he ascended to heaven and is now there ruling, sitting on the throne with his father and saying, we're going to join him there. In other words, the Lord, capital letters, our Lord is majestic. He's worthy of all our praise. We were called to rule the world in a way that would bring more honor and glory to the Lord, to make creation prosper and shine with glory that is fitting for our master, but we failed. So Jesus has come to do what we couldn't do. He has taken back control of the world. All things are under his feet now, says Paul. And one day we'll get to rule, as God originally intended for us, rule over all creation and do it right. In the meantime, as those who know Jesus, I want us to think about how we can rule well already now. And that starts with leaning into Jesus, depending on him and his grace, seeking to have the mind and heart of Christ so that we know how to use our God-given authority well. Jesus is calling us to let the creation, the whole world, blossom under our care. Let our children develop and grow in a way that brings glory to God and reverences his name. Let our work each day do the same. As we plant our gardens, nurture and tend them so that these small things shout with glory to God. Let the way we treat others show that we are people controlled by the spirit of Jesus who care for one another with Christ-like love. As people saved by Jesus, we can begin to magnify the name of the Lord more and more. Jesus has redeemed us and restored us so that we can rule the world as God intends so that it magnifies his name more and more. Let's pray. Lord, our Lord, once again, we magnify your name. We realize we don't do it perfectly. We do it far from perfectly. You are the one who needed to come to redeem the world that you created so wonderfully, that you left to our care, and that we have failed to care for adequately. Lord, we are prone to destroy instead of to rule wisely and have dominion as you intended. So will you forgive us and will you help us by the power of your Holy Spirit through Jesus, our Savior and Lord, who regained control of the world, who regained dominion over it all. Help us by your Spirit, Lord Jesus, to live lives that continue to bring glory and honor to you, that magnify your name. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well,